it's got the worst drainage system known to man. So we're gonna have to make a very nice, very complete self-venting subfloor. We'll be doing some things for sure, but this is this is very troubling. I don't know what to do about it. It kind of bothers me deeply. So we're going to, um, I don't know, we're gonna have to reapproach how this is done. That it doesn't drain at all. We knew that going into it, that it was, I mean, the old ones don't have, they have, they have serious design flaws that are no longer present in new boats like no divots underneath not that the divots don't get clogged anyways that that slowly drain the water out the back but um also integrated kills which this thing thankfully doesn't i'm sorry also like external kills and side fins which this thing has integrated stamped kills so that's fine it's a problem so however we make the drain channel it needs to be legitimate and we might even might even affect how we lay the foam in We'll see. Laying the subfloor is one thing. Foaming it, which it definitely does need foam, absolutely needs foam. We're gonna figure that out. FYI, we already framed the subfloor during this video. It was such a long, extensive thing. It deserved its own video. You can check that up in the description area or view the entire playlist for this boat build. Where we left off from that was we only finished part of the under supports. We put the under supports right there underneath the core as we have that open core laid out and we need those for a few reasons one to support the entire subfloor and then two to make a good layout for the middle channel to where we can break stuff in and we will be showing that to you later as we're still not done even after all this but quickly i want to touch with what i've been recording lately with it used to be gopros but now it's only one camera the insta 360 one x2 is one camera that sees everything so no matter what you can put it on you can put it on all standard gopro mounts with a quarter 20 adapter and you can see anything you wanna see in real time, any view, any angle, and you have specific software on your computer and your phone that can follow any place you want it to follow. So if you catch a fish, like the GoPros, when you used to just kinda of go all over the place, you would totally miss frame every time you like set your hook or every time you bent down to get the fish, the GoPro would record the deck. It would record like seriously crucial parts that were just pointless unless you had it in a POV mode back there on a Yolotech stick. The only way to kind of get shots like this were on a head mount, but the head mount would spin every time you turned your head to go grab something. And even then the head mount was too high and it bubbled and fish eyed everything. The best place to get it is on the chest. So I have this on a chesty mount, but I'm swiveling it everywhere. So every time I duck down or move anywhere, I'm able to keep the camera horizontal and pointed wherever I want to point. It has software keyframes for people who know how to edit. And it has this like just tool that you can just overlap whatever you're trying to watch. And then it just tracks that and does all the editing for you. The entire series for this budget build is actually recorded on just this one camera. I used to have two or three GoPros set up and then I have to render two or three different SD cards just to make one video and I hated it. So I really like this camera. We get reached out to collaborate with a lot of people. Sometimes you never see their stuff because my word, my integrity is all I have. But when you see me promote something, it's because I truly believe in it and I'm gonna go with this camera all the way. It's gonna replace all my GoPros, everything. Because, well, look what it's doing. This is with no real advanced editing, just simple knowledge of their editing program that they have on the desktop. That's it. And they also have a phone one. You can point the lens anywhere you want it and it still keeps completely horizontal. It's really good for action shots like this where you only have one real option to mount a camera while you're doing everything else. Here I'm towing my kids. If this was a GoPro or any other third party action cam, I would not be able to get an accurate point just based on it being on a mount. The boat would move back and forth, up and down, and it likely wouldn't keep the subject in frame, and you definitely couldn't get shots like this. It's beyond just like running it on a selfie stick when you're ice skating or snowboarding down a ledge. It is like your own personal film crew, and no longer have to have somebody follow you around with a camera, especially important if you're a DIY creator or a personal creator doing vlogs of any sort, where something can just follow you around the room and you can just edit it because it sees everything, that is invaluable. I think that most people promoting this camera have missed the true point of that, but I've caught it now. If you want this camera, check it out in the description area below. There's a special promo code link just for you. All right, so after sitting on the subfloor, I figured out this strategy. We are gonna use pore foam and we're gonna use pink foam. This is how we're gonna use both. We're gonna use pink foam on the outer edge. You could cut it in slots and stick it in the middle, but that's just gonna be way too much cutting. So I figured I would just cut one sheet and then seal it on the very, very outside. We are using Great Stuff Gap Filler. You could also use a closed cell quad foam. It's not gonna matter. This stuff is really not meant for flotation. It's meant to fill gaps. And there's such a minute amount of it that it being open cell clearly doesn't matter. In fact, we're gonna be sealing off any and all ends that are gonna have this exposed to the elements in and of itself. Once we do that, I use a hot knife. Really, I should have just used a utility knife because if you just cut one strip down, this stuff actually just pops right off. 
but I kind of wanted an even kill because I cut that piece. That piece is already pre-cut when I got the sheet. It just pops off. And I used the other side, mounted the exact same way I did there. And I, you know, that that great stuff, the reason why I wanted it over the closed cell quad foam is because it's stickier. It's a great adhesive for foam to stick to anything, including foam on foam itself. So that's why I used it in conjunction with trying to seal all the gaps that would later bleed out pore foam we're gonna pour into each and one of those individual pockets. There are nine individual pockets on each side. We are also cutting, forming, and shaping the pink foam as well as the gap filler with a hot knife. It leaves a nasty fume and vapor that will kill you. It'll give you a huge headache and ruin your day. Um, so wear a respirator. And now for the gutter system that bleeds any water coming into the side right directly into the middle channel. And that's a huge part. We only did that in one other boat, which was a LUN. But now that we have another deep V close to the similar frame like that, and we're developing the subfloor from scratch, I want to reimplement the same deal. I took a, the cheapest garden hose I could find at Home Depot, which is substantially cheaper than using any sort of marine grade hose or flex hose for bilge, which is what I would use before. But really that's like 22 bucks. Use that. And it's, you know, get a hundred feet of it or 150 feet of it, whatever. It's, it's going to be enough to definitely do this. It will, it will, it'll immediately drain any sort of compartments that we have here, including the big foam pockets or anything that we have like that on the side, which we will likely have those because, you know, that's a, that's a pretty crucial and integral part of the boat is like the foam pockets. Where are those going to go? And they're generally going to go right here where the rod locker is. And they're not going to go past probably right here or on the sides into the channel. We're going to seal the channel off even more. The middle is not done. We have more to do to the middle. The middle is been seeing me. I'm thinking somewhere down the line, silicone and some other stuff but was what we're going to really use in between the crevices on the sides to really tuck and have a long-term solution. But nonetheless, we're now ready to pour pockets of pore foam and the, the voids are left over. So they'll actually be joining. It'll maybe be stiffer that way. The biggest, most ridiculous bucket we have can fill up to six liters or... 224 ounces, man, that's a lot. Maybe we don't do that much. Do later after we run the plumbing down the channel and we clean that channel up and we seal off the channel and we do a few other things and obviously make some modifications to the inner ribs so water can actually flow through that thing and not just stagnate and sit there and ruin my floor. We are going to figure that, we're going to figure that out, but we are going to pour from now. So that was a uh, one gallon even. That was 128 ounces, and it is. I kind of wish me. I kind of wish I would have tapered it and let it f drop here and flow down that way. Some would have covered it versus me thinking it was gonna push up in here. Because now I'm gonna have to cut it. Oh, that sucks. It's not the biggest deal. It's just annoying. It's got like a double chin. You see that? I don't know why it's doing that. All right. So this is 128 ounce fluid ounces. There's over twice. It seems to be twice as much as what I actually need. So I reduced it to 64 ounces and this is what I got. Now granted it hasn't had as much time to cure and go over, but so far it's not looking great. Unless this stuff really just starts to kick in gear. Like right now we are going to have to actually use more. And so the reason I think that is, is because this stuff is really contingent upon heat. It's not, it's actually a pretty decent temperature inside the garage. So that's good. It's like maybe perfect temperature, but the actual amount that you have, any sort of hardening resonant or foaming resin two part, like it's very collect, it's very contingent on it and its amount of heat in terms of how fast it cures and this point, how fast it activates. And I think the more resin in each pocket really actually helped the foam expand because there was more of it there, more heat, more energy, boom. So we actually got more with less because we're gonna actually have to use more and we're gonna get less expansion. So that's kind of a fail, not a huge fail, but it is in terms of actual foam density. So what we have here is an overpour, but this is actually full two pound density. So we always get questions, oh, six pound density or 10 pound density good? No. Now whole thing about foam, why it's so good, obviously the fact that it adds structure is that it's density. 
You want the lightest density per mass possible. That way, when water comes and tries to saturate and sink your boat, you have all this resistance because the dense, it's all about density resistance. Same thing when we make baits over there to pouring the subfloor and pouring foam in here. It's all about density, whether or not something will be able to float or sink or slow sink or whatever. And you want the lightest density foam, obviously, for one reason, to keep your boat lighter. And two, because its mass per volume will resist water sinking. Specifically, that's, that's the whole key is density. You know, it's not looking so bad. It's actually starting to, to level out in some spots. Like it's not as horrendous as I thought it was, but it's still not great. Fail. This is why I did not want to do multiple pours. It never comes out even. It comes out like this. A lot of times it's not this bad, but because I was trying to get it even, and I still have to pour more. I still have to pour more. So really what I should have done, I, sh I thought about it, but then I went against my gut and tried to overthink it. What I should have done is just did what I did over here. I should have poured 128 ounces a little bit more effectively and swirled it down from the top down here, and it would have just filled all this up, and I would have had to cut it anyways. But really, if you look over here, cutting is not a really big deal. It's kind of a pain. You're like aiming at like a machete or a, or a, a handsaw, but you can also use a sawzall. Parts of it still didn't even fill up. We're gonna have to do another pour, just to over pour, and then maybe spread it with like a brush or something. That way it gets an even rise. It didn't fill there, it didn't fill there. Not It not filling is what I'm worried about. Like it's one thing for it to like be cut in the top because we can just like paint over it with like oil-based enamel or something and that'll just reseal all those cells so it's sealed off again it's not a big deal but it's this crap where the water can get in say water splashes in between the subfloor and the frame and gets in there because that's likely to happen while you're shutting down the water with water in your boat you're sh you know water in your boat and it goes in there so you know <sighs> it's a freaking shit show and i also didn't seal off as good as i thought because someone got out We'll be cleaning this middle channel out. Some cool things will be going in the middle channel. We'll get rid of this deformity and uh, it'll all look like that by the next time we come. And then we'll really kind of tie the subfloor up. The subfloor is a very important thing though. So it, a lot of time is gonna be put into it because when you have a really good subfloor, the rest of your boat, you wouldn't believe how much it does for your boat. When you have a good subfloor, especially in a boat small like this with not very high walls and really super thin margin for the subfloor to be okay. When it's good, it's good. So let's just uh, make sure it stays good. So we cut it with the Sawzall before we cut it with the straight blade. It did come out straighter with that, you can tell, but that took so long. I couldn't deal with that. So I just bent a Sawzall blade and did it. We're gonna come back over here with a grinder and a sanding wheel, and that just cuts this right off. Whoop. Can you hear this stuff popping still? Kinda crazy that it's popping. Now that we opened all that foam up, we have to reseal it. Now you could do this a few ways. You can use epoxy again, but that is a lot of epoxy. Know that this stuff will soak that epoxy up and you will spend hundreds of dollars. You'll spend more on the epoxy than you did on the pour foam trying to reseal it. And there you could, I was told to use oil-based enamel, you could just paint it with that and it probably would work, but oil-based and epoxy-based stuff in my previous experience did not work great well. So what I used was garage floor paint, which is the toughest epoxy based paint that i mean you can paint garage floors with it it's pretty durable and it'll soak up in there and the foam is just eating it up i used like most of the bucket i later went down in there and sealed off the very bottom of the pink foam and the top 
where I saw any residual gaps where the where the paint didn't get and around the hose ends. What that does is that really just seals the bottom up so when water just sits in that channel, it's not gonna get through there. And to my best of my knowledge, pink foam is really super resistant and not retaining water. Definitely the best out of all three that we use in these scenarios. And I think the silicone will do a much better job of bonding to the hole and staying bonded over time versus 3M5200 where when it dries, you can just peel it right off the hole. It's very, very sticky when it's not cured though, but it's deceivingly not sticky once it dries. Have, let's see, 3 8 sheet of plywood is what this is gonna call for. Cause we have really tight spacing, not a big giant gap, very tight. That's like six, seven inches. 3 8 will hold that tight gap all day. And on top of the framing we will put on top of the wood, we're only gonna have a slight section here. This one joiner rail here is gonna be perfect for how we join the back deck. It's very nice and necessary and needed. Everything's level. We level the whole thing. We made sure the foam pockets are either level or just slightly under the rails here. So we're gonna go ahead and get this, but first off, we gotta make a template. There are ways you can make a template. You can use construction board from the dollar store. You can use old pieces of cardboard boxes. I'm going to use foam board. And you can also use thin strips of wood, although that's super uneconomic considering how expensive wood is. Foam board is still fairly cheap. I got this at Hobby Lobby for like five or six bucks. And it used to be like really cheap, like three bucks, but man, you know, inflation. But this stuff works just as well. It's stiff enough. You can cut it in squirts. Definitely cut it with a utility knife. If you try and cut it with scissors, it'll crinkle and, and it'll ruin what you're trying to do. But we're cutting this into thin strips. And then we're gonna use a hot glue gun to piece it all together as we contour it along the side of the boat. Then we're gonna take this template and measure it right along a four by eight sheet of plywood and use it accordingly. We just mark with a marker around these hoses, right? And then um, when we put this template on there, we'll measure the whole distance from here to here, make that the actual distance of where we start our lines that taper down obviously to the front where that's its whole thing. And I'll show you. We have to compensate for the ribs. The ribs are gonna be the only thing that kind of messes up here. Plus we have the hose, so it's gonna have to be an extra wide gap. So we are not gonna be able to do that unless we do a really complicated bend in and out thing, which I think we can bypass. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna do is we're gonna measure a chew four by eights and we're gonna measure the chew like width of the both front and back beam. And then we're gonna measure that on a piece of plywood. We'll show you here in a second. But right now where I'm trying to get is a very accurate depiction and, and width of where these hoses and ribs are because we're going to have to cut that out with a hole saw on the main subfloor board. So that's what we're doing right now. So the back one is really easy because the back beam is 40 inches exactly, four by eight sheet of plywood. It's 48 inches at the, at, at the bottom and top. But tapering up there, we had, to, we had to really find the finicky spot. It was about 33 inches, I think, the front beam. And then we just, once we tied those together, it's pretty easy to get the line because the line was already glued and stripped together with these pieces of foam board. Then we gapped it. We replicated where the circles were. And we got a hole saw that we I felt was gonna be big enough or actually measured it right there on the stuff before, before coming out here and cutting all these holes. And then any areas that could not be taken care of with the hole saw can be taken care of with a jigsaw. And then the main line is very easy to cut after we take care of said parts with a regular circular saw of any kind. Just trim right along the line and we have our gaps and everything ready to go. This is looking pretty good to me. The only thing we have left is to go forth and test it out. Hope we get it right because wood's expensive. Oh look, it fits. Now we're gonna do something because I always get complaints about how I don't measure stuff, how I just wing it and build as I go. And everybody's like, where's the schematics? Where's the measurements? Well here, let's throw something in here a little different. We're gonna, ho we're gonna go ahead and grid this thing we're gonna get verbatim where the actual, you know, beams are, and then we're gonna get verbatim where the actual subfloor channel is. That way we have a perfect, like, actual spot for where we're gonna put in all the rivets to hold this thing down. We're gonna be using standard pan hand rivets and like the gator skins on the floor, so to avert the divot, you know, the problems that it, that has with the matting, the little bubble from the pan head, we're gonna be just countersinking in with a, with a little honing bit the spot for each pan head rivet. And we're probably gonna need a 3 4 inch long rivet for this, so we'll have to go to the hardware store and get some. Okay, after we took care of that, now we have to start sealing it. 
I'm going to use marine resin. And again, we talked about different ways to seal this. You could use oil-based enamel, but I do not think that will last at all. You could use epoxy garage paint, which I think would last pretty well, actually a long time, but I don't know if you get any actual penetration. To get good penetration inside the wood and it still lasts a long time, you need some sort of epoxy and a good epoxy. You could use polyester resin, Bondo resin, yeah, but marine resin is gonna be the best. If you're on a budget and you're gonna use wood for a subfloor and you want it to last, epoxy really is the only option. Whether you need information, tutorials, products, or simply connections to other tiny boaters around you, we have it all right here. All right, so here it is. Fits pretty well. It's slightly off tapering the front, and I worried about that because there were some hoses that stuck out a little far and I couldn't get the, the foam bore template in there enough. I was just trying to avoid retrimming, but now that I thought about it, I would use my templates because the, the templates actually did get the perfect contour of the boat. They're just a little short on the edges, but if I would have measured the stupid, you know, each, each rib across, then I would have got it. So I would have done that. That's the only thing, but it's not a big deal because we're going to have to end up pouring inside to seal that off. So you're wondering how you're going to seal off the inside. You're going to get the last little bit of pour foam that you have, and you're going to just pour, you know, an ounce or two of it in here. Let it bubble up, bubble it around here and bubble up here. And then you're going to just cut it off flush with, say, a an oscillating tool or whatever. And then you're that's when you're going to cut the, the tube flush which we will be gator skidding the floor. It's the toughest stuff you can put on the floor. It's gonna, and then you can run it up the side. Once we clean up this floor, we're gonna be cleaning up a little bit of this paint so that so the gator skin can stick to it, make it a stickable surface. And then it'll just stick right here and you'll actually have a pretty pretty sealed off floor um, where the water will only redirect down the tubes. So that is a win for us. We are winning there. So it got pretty good, but you can see, see the spots where they're not glossy, like right in there. That is, we need to recoat that, all of that. Most of it's glossy, some of it's not. So it actually took a lot of resin, kind of made me sick to my stomach to soak in all that. So if you're using non-marine grade plywood, just know that the resin is going to be soaking in more. Let's see that, that will run. At least the initial surface. The, it won't run into the deep core of the wood, but it will start in, it'll start to initiate rot right there. Now I know this because in my own boat where I, I was like, ah, oh, it's soaked in resin, it can't rot. So everywhere it was glossy and coated, it did not. And still to this day, the subfloor gets beat up in my, in my boat, but it does not rot where it is thick and caked on. So my subfloor is doing really well in my boat. But right here, we're gonna have to go over that knowing, and we're also gonna have to go over the edges, which were a little hard to get while it was on the deck. But we'll make sure to get those. And we'll likely do that when we are doing this on the other side. But we are not gonna coat it yet because we are gonna be having to drill a hole up there for the live well, and then we're gonna to have to be running plumbing. So let's take a look at what we've got down here. So I cut those hoses off, and I, you can see the sealants of the silicone, and it actually worked really well. I do think that will hold um, with the constant shuttering and everything that the subfloor does. I think the silicone will hold better. I know 3 and 5200s uh, recommended, but I do think that that would probably be better for uh, like under the water line you know, hardware into the whole stuff. I think that's where that's really, really sorely needed versus in this application, I don't think that 35200 would do fairly well versus silicone. I know silicone sticks to pretty much anything once it dries, including pink foam. We still have to drip it holes. We're gonna be dripping holes right here. I'll be drilling small little 316s. I might expand that to one fourth, but I don't know if I'm gonna push it, but just little holes right in the bottom in here and right there. And we're gonna be doing that to each and every last one of them. And so a lot of people have reached out to me about the subfloor pop because they, so many people have subfloors like these and they reached out to me and really they have done this. And I asked them, let me know how it goes. So far, it, I think it's it's doing pretty good. So long as you don't drill too big of a hole to where it's gonna weaken the gusset, any hole that drains water out will keep out the residual one inch pocket of water that these each of these tubes will just residually have. If you have a boat like this, Always keep it jacked up and when you're storing it with the drain plug out. And this thing has the oldest, most archaic drain plug. That's how you know this boat is old. They don't make stuff like that no more. Not even close. I don't even know if that thing seals. I mean, I don't know what to do. The epoxy paint did its job. It did take a while to dry in places where I puddled it, like all those deep holes. I made sure to puddle the epoxy paint in there and it did take a few days. 
weeks, but it eventually did cure over and dry. It did exactly what it was supposed to do. There's some little residual gaps right here where I'm gonna have to just close off a silicone. And then we're going to be siliconing all the major stems, all the, all the major supports. We'll be running beads, 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 before we stick the final subfloor on top. And then we're gonna, I mean, the silicone will just sandwich between the subfloor and the beads to seal that off. That way water that runs in this channel can't overspill inside these pockets and get in there anyways. We're gonna be handling that because you know water in there is water that's never gonna come out. And then once that's done, the only place that water will ever be able to go is from the sides, but we have the gutters. And if we seal it off the sides with gator skins, like I believe we can, and then again, any residual gaps with say silicone, uh, we are definitely gonna be able to close off this whole subfloor and we're gonna really make this thing very, very structurally sound. And as long as somebody takes care of this correctly, I think the subfloor will last a very, very long while. Also check this thing out on the fly jack plates. We have reels linking on it on Instagram and the YouTube shorts talking about it. This was donated by John, I appreciate it. We are selling these on our website because they are freaking dope. And this one is specifically made for a small outboard. This is a really small outboard. I don't really know if this thing starts. It, I, I was told it starts. We're gonna give this away probably with the boat build. So it's a little 99 Evern Rude. I don't know anybody in town who knows how to fix this thing up, but somebody out there knows how to still fix these things up. And I hope whoever that person is, uh, whoever gets this boat knows somebody like that. Just jacks the boat up. You can actually get on it pretty fast. If you, if you can like grab it and get on that jack, it just reminds me a lot of like a trailer jack. I think that's actually what it is. Somebody's really smart, made a very, very robust jack plate. I mean, this thing is nice. Look at how thick it is. Look at the hardware. They weren't playing around. UH&W plastic sleeve. So this thing slides up and down the track seamlessly with no binding. And then this, look at the handle, the machine handle. And then it just hangs, and it goes way up there. Like that is really far up. That is a seven inch raise. That's high. I don't know what kind of motor you have, like, but your motor is gonna be fine. Like the cavitation plate is well above the bottom of the line. <laughs> it's way up there, look at that. It's like way up. It's like a whole four inches uh, above the water line. So if you wanted that motor really far out for flats or just to get whatever, because yeah, if you run shallow and yeah, good luck trying to tilt that thing manually. Like manual tilt sucks. But if you can raise this thing up really, really quick to avoid screwing up your prop or your uh, your skeg, definitely a worthwhile deal. And it's very affordable. It's like the Goldilocks zone between manual jack plates and DOI jack plates and that of true hydraulic jack plates. This thing is every bit as effective as a hydraulic jack plate, for sure. Plus you don't have to worry about wiring your boat for it or worrying about relays burning out and your jack plate just being stuck that way when you need to go down or up. Something to think about. We will be demoing that video here pretty shortly. Next video coming up is obviously running the plumbing and then running the live well. And we have an economy live well mod that I've been wanting to do for a very long time. And now we're gonna finally get to do it. Stay tuned.